In my prayer in preparation for today, I asked the Lord to sh give me what he would have me to share. And I believe that what God gave me is for all of us today. I know it blessed me putting it together. And the title of today's message is God's Will for Your Life. A very simple, a very simple title, God's Will for Your Life. And being that this is the last Sunday of January, if you're like me, some of the things that you resolve to do in the new year, after about four weeks of doing some of those things, some have fallen by the wayside. And that's what tend to happen when we make resolutions. Sometimes we're able to stick to some of them, but more times than not, we tend to slip and allow some to go by. Some of you may have made decisions to develop your life more spiritually and developing your relationship with the Lord and studying more and doing more, attending church more. You may find yourself slipping a little bit. Some may have resolved to working on their relationships, spouses and children and parents and so forth and so on. You may, may have resolved to you know, work on your body in the gym and maybe you started off doing real well the first of the year and now you're slipping a little bit. That's what we tend to do for various reasons. We get distracted from the things that we plan to do. So today, the message hopefully will inspire you to stick to those things that you have resolved to do that you know that is God's will for your life. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 through 13, Paul instructs us about the part that the scriptures play. Now, when he wrote it, he was referring to the Old Testament scripture or the Torah, and he said, these things happened to them. And he was talking about things that happened to the Israelites in the old days and how they came out of Egypt and went through the wilderness and so forth and so on. He was saying these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. They were examples that were written down as warnings for us. And indeed, in our day and time, both Old and New Testament writings are examples and warnings for us. It says, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. And then he goes on and he shares this familiar passage with us. No temptation has seized you except what is coming to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And indeed, when it comes to making resolutions and making plans and falling by the wayside and getting distracted, that's not new. That's not a new thing. God's children have been distracted in Old Testament time and New Testament times and throughout history. The enemy is a distraction. And he seeks to distract. And we want to look at one particular example from King Solomon. And at the point that he rose to the kingship, God gave him something. He gave him wisdom in a measure greater than any wisdom he had given to any other human at that particular point in time. The wisest man ever at that point in time. But even that wise man was distracted and failed to fulfill God's will for his life. We want to look at some of the things that Solomon said about his experience and about those things that happened in his life that caused him to be distracted and, and what was his conclusion about the matter. He wrote down in Ecclesiastes for us the example 
uh, that we can look at about his life so that we are warned and therefore do not repeat the same mistake that he did. And keep in mind that if this wise man was distracted, then you and I can be distracted as well. And in fact, we do get distracted. That's why many of us who made resolutions to do certain things have already been distracted and are not following through with some of those things. That's how distractions work. We have distractions around us all the time. In the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the question that is sought by Solomon to address was, quote, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun. What profit is that? And he points out in Ecclesiastes that he tried to find profit and value in the things like pleasure and wealth and great accomplishments and materialism. But in the end, it was like grasping the wind. That's what this old man said, because when he wrote Ecclesiastes, he was an old man. And he wrote down for us in Ecclesiastes what took place in his life and how he saw it at the end of his life. And if you know about Solomon, and, if, and, and indeed it's recorded in Scripture over in Ecclesiastes, is one place you can find out things about this man. But over in 1 Kings, around chapter 9, 10, and 11, you can also see some things about Solomon. Things that he acquired as a king. The number of wives and concubines that he had. And concubines is just a big word that means women on the side in our day and time. Combined, he had about a thousand women. Now, what can you do with a thousand women? <laughs> what can what can you do with a thousand? But he was a wise man. But somewhere he slipped up, didn't he? Because we ain't that wise and we know you can't handle a thousand women, right? <laughs> right, brother? <laughs> Nor can the women handle a thousand men. That doesn't even compute, doesn't even make sense, does it? But these things eventually distracted him and got him off course that course that God had him on, which was the will that God had for his life. And you can see the promises God made to him at the beginning of the kingship. If you obey me and do what I tell you to do, God had those promises there for him. But he went after the material things. He went after the pleasure. He said in the Ecclesiastes, he did not, did not spare himself nothing. Whatever he wanted, he went after And being the king, I imagine you can do that. But at the end of his life, after he had repented and came to his senses, he wrote Ecclesiastes and he said, all of that were like chasing after the wind. All vanity. That word profit where he says, what profit a man, that simply means what gain or what value. What value is it to a person or to a man? who toils and labor under the sun. It says like vanity. That word vanity is from a Hebrew word that means breath. So in other words, he was saying it's like chasing out of the wind and you cannot grasp the wind. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, we want to take a look at some things that Apostle Paul said. Chapter 5, verse 8 of Ephesians it says, for you were once darkness, and indeed we all were once darkness. Notice it does not say you were once in darkness. It says you were once darkness. You were darkness. We were darkness. We, at one time we were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. So not, no longer are we darkness, but we are light. We are light. Jesus talks about that light over in Matthew. We are the light of the world. Paul goes on to say, live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. You have to find out what pleases the Lord. He goes on to say in verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention 
what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then in verse 15, he says this. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are what? Evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understand what the Lord's will is. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. don't be a fool. But understand what the Lord's will is. He goes on to say in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God, the father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's hone in on verse 15 through 17. Again, in the NIV, it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days of e are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In the New King James, it says it like this. See then that you walk circumspectly circumspectly, big word, but it simply means to be very, very careful how you walk. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. King James says, walk circumspectly. NIV says, be very careful then how you live. And it carries the understanding in the interpretation in the original that is like tiptoeing and making sure that every step you take is a measured step and you know exactly where you're putting your foot. That's the understanding that the Greek gives here. Be very, very careful how you live. Don't be a fool but be wise. And simply a fool is an unwise person. Although Solomon had been endowed with wisdom beyond measure given to any other man at that point in time, he was a fool during a period of time in his life when he allowed the distractions to lead him off course in following God's will for his life. And therefore, we can say today that for any of God's children who are off course and not following God's will for your life, you're a fool. And different points in time, we all are foolish when we choose to say no to God and do things our own way. And it's not just the children and the teenagers who do that. Adults do that, too. And oftentimes we want, we want to come down hard on the teenagers, and I say this quite often to parents, they just been here 10 years, 13 years, 15 years. We've been here, some of us, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and we still are foolish at points in time. Anytime we say no to God or say no to God's will for our lives, we're foolish. We're being a fool. We're not being wise. So keep that in mind as we progress through today's lesson. A bishop once stated in a sermon some years ago, and this is a quote, direct quote from Bishop. A fool learns from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. When he taught that, it made a lot of sense to me. Because when we do foolish things and we get off track, we deal with the consequences of that sin or we deal with the consequences of that bad decision, that bad choice. And as a fool, we learn from it, don't we? 
But he goes on to say, but a wise person, a wise man, a wise woman, a wise youth learn from the mistakes of others. So when it comes to the Old and New Testament and all of those people that are in there, whether they are Samson and this I'm stupid or Solomon this I'm stupid or David or whoever they may be, we can learn from the stupid mistakes that they did. Yes, sir. Isn't that right? Yes, and we don't have to repeat those. Young people can learn from the mistakes of their parents and parents can share those mistakes with their young people so their young people don't have to make the same mistake they make. And I think that's important for parents to do. Let your child know, let your teenager know that you're not all perfect. Let them know that you have not always been where you're at spiritually. Let them know that there are times in your life where you acted a fool. And by doing that, you give them hope that if you got your life together, they can get theirs together too. But if you put yourself on a, on a pedestal in your child's eyes, he or she may get to the point where they believe that it's not doable for them. In essence, we need to keep it real with our children. Anytime I have to counsel someone young, I always tend to throw in a few of my life experiences where I, I was foolish. And I do that purposely. I want them to know they can get it together too. And indeed they can. They can get it together. So no matter where you're at, you may be acting a fool right now. You don't have to continue acting a fool. You can get it together. Marilyn Hickey says this, a quote from Marilyn Hickey, if you do not plan to accomplish certain things each day, your life and future will be simply an accident ruled by circumstance. Think about that for a moment. If you do not plan to accomplish certain things each day, your life and future will be simply an accident ruled by circumstance. Many of you are living just like that. I used to live like that. But many of you are living like that right now. You don't have no plan for the future. You don't have no dreams, no hopes, no ambitions. You got a job, perhaps. You got a family, perhaps. But each day you get up, there's no vision for that day. There's no vision for the year. There's no vision for the season of life that you're in. You're just living from day to day. And when you live like that from day to day, you will miss out on God's best for your life. You will miss out and not accomplish and complete the purpose and, and goals that God has for you. And that's why he says in verse 15, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. You see, you can't make the most of every opportunity if you don't have some vision for your life and where you're going. And you need to make sure that each day you're doing something to accomplish that vision, to push you further and further towards that goal of completing what God intended for you to do. So you need to decide which things are most important in your day and which things are not. And by doing that, you can use your time more successfully. So think about it. Think about your typical day. And think about all the things that you do in your typical day. And ask yourself, which, out of those things, which, are, which, are, which one of them or which group of them are important and which aren't? Now, last week I was blessed by some things Bishop said, and that's the way the word of God is supposed to work when you hear it. If you're in error in a particular place in your life and you hear the word of God, it should convict you in that particular area and cause you to want to get something right that you've been doing wrong. 
And I realized from listening to the sermon last week that I've been watching too much TV. I had. Certain shows, they come on back to back. And you could sit there all day. <laughs> all day. Because they're good, right? <laughs> you get caught up. But then at the end of that four, five hours of looking at TV, you, you wonder, man, what have I done? Nothing, zip, zero. I've wasted that time. And I know I'm not the only one in here who's guilty of that. This past week, I can't say with confidence, I'm doing better. I'm doing better. But that's just one distraction that the Word of God convicted me of last week. When you're listening and the Word of God convicts you, that's the time to think about doing something about that. That's not the time to get mad at the messenger. That's not the time to get mad at God. That is our Heavenly Father's doing. He's doing that. He's trying to get you to the point where you are accomplishing His will. He's opening your eyes and showing you how the enemy is distracting you and robbing you of your time. And time is a very valuable resource. Very valuable resource. In order to manage that time, you have to exercise some self-discipline. Some self-control. Nobody could control my TV watching except me. I had to do something different. I had to choose not to turn it on. Or I had to choose to look at something more constructive if I did turn it on. But that choice was mine. And it required discipline on my part. And all of God's children have the ability to self-discipline themselves. 